Yay, it says it's live. Hey everybody, this is Ari. Very excited to be here. I love these interactive formats because then I get to hear from you. And it's not just me recording a video and you are watching. Okay, let me just see if I can find the chat. Could somebody just let me know if you can hear everything? Sounds okay, bass sounds okay. I know there's a little bit of a delay. But I'd love to know who we have. Guitar players, bass players, let me know your instrument. Let me know where you're calling in from. I'm sitting here in California and it's early afternoon, mid-afternoon. I'd love to know where you're at and what instrument you play. I want to talk about technique today. Um, there's sometimes a topic that people um, maybe misunderstand, maybe not take seriously enough. I have a cat, um, I have a, oh cool, sounds good. Okay, good, perfect, excellent, thank you. Um, I have a, a background in classical music and, you know, we did technique way before we did even any kind of music, you know. So I think that's overdoing it too, but I think technique is a really great uh, topic because if you do technique right, then the music can flow through you much more freely. And um, that's what we want. We want to get out of the way so that the music can come. And one of the most, um, I think, unhelpful things is that we tend to overwork and that we tend to tense up. And because a lot of what we do technically is so unconsciously because we play so much and we, you know, have our attention up to what the notes are, our fellow musicians, the gig, the sound guy, the, you know, whatever it is, but there's a lot of attention on a lot of things. So oftentimes when we start tensing up or cramping up or playing really hard or over, we're overworking the, um, the left hand or something like that or having our you know, shoulders up by our ears, we're often not even aware of it. You can hear it and you can see it when you're in the audience, but because we're so in it, we don't recognize it. And that's why it can sometimes be a little bit hard if we've been doing it for many years in a way that's not conducive to letting the music flow. It can be very hard to change that habit. So that's something I'd like to talk um, a little bit about today. I also have, I'm going to be playing you some stuff. I also want to talk about how to get maybe up to speed. I have a lot of material on how to get up to speed or how to do some virtuoso stuff. And all of that is built on a uh, like solid foundation. So if you want to like, let me know what, you know, interests you and sort of, I'd be doing a little bit much talking in the beginning, but then there'll be a reward with some fun playing. So um, whether you're a guitar player or bass player, as I said, you're very welcome. And I hope that um, the tips are good for everybody uh guitarist from algeria wow very cool australia yay we're going around the world i love it um better sound quality than oh uh, uh, oh good to hear chris a uh, christian that you have good quality that's great yeah i'm super proud to be part of the true fire family i can't thank these guys enough for having me and um i i have my pentatonic playground dvd right here which i'm very proud and happy proud of and happy with. I send a lot of my students there and um, get great feedback back. So I'm, I'm really happy to be part of the fold. One of the igniters. Yay. <laughs> okay, we have guitar players. And uh, mm, I don't know what that means. Fadley, 23. I don't know what that means. Louisiana in the house. Awesome. Wow, that's really exciting. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll be monitoring the check text the chat all the time if you have a question you feel free to put it in bold letters or or all caps or something so I, I'm, I'm sure to see it or repeat it that's all good I'll try to to monitor it south of you down in San Francisco right on <laughs> hey California Philly electric guitar fabulous excellent um, so I'll be talking about something where I actually have some online resources if you want to follow along also be happy to send them to Jeff. I didn't get that together in time, actually. Um, I just realizing. But if you go to my website, arianacap.com, there's a learn tab. And if you click on that, you will see some of the handouts that I want to briefly talk about because I got some methods. I love step-by-step -step stuff because if you have, if you make a process simple, and we're talking about changing a habit, right? We're talking about, um, making unconscious habits of playing in a certain technique um, conscious and that takes some finagling and I'm I have um, I'm pre I have a, a method that I teach it's called the Pora method and uh, I have some handouts for that that you can download off my website if you like it's free and um, 
no strings attached and there are um there are two two um handouts that i'm going to be looking at but anyways i wanted to talk about just in general whether you're a guitar player or a bass player what constitutes good technique because we're all put together in a different way we all have different lengths of fingers and you know our strength is is di differently you know some people may be more strong in the hands or the arms or in the torso and all of that has an effect of how our technique is panning out and hence how we sound how what the, what our tone is like and uh, it would be foolish to say you have to hold your fingers at a certain angle, you have to do a certain amount of movement or not amount of movement or something like that because it's very individual. That said, there are some um, guidelines that we can use, some things that are true uh, for everybody. And they're also true for even things like playing golf or tennis or sports, you know, or martial arts. They use similar principles. and. Um, so I want to talk about that really quickly to sort of get us all on the same page. What do I mean when I talk about good technique, right? Sounds so elusive. And one of those handouts is on my arianacap.com page in the learning tab. So good technique, I call good technique when we are conscious about what we're doing, if we want to, if we want to zoom into what we're doing, we can. Um, we feel connected with the instrument, we feel coordinated. So left and right is in sync, all that good stuff. Um, and then two very important points. We minimize mo uh, movement, but we maximize relaxation, okay? And the sheet I'm looking at, it looks like this, and it's on my website, arianacap.com. And um, I just scroll down to the infographics and it's there. And uh, again, it's bass technique, but it's definitely also true for other instruments. Um, and so what exactly does this mean? So to, to minimize movement and to maximize relaxation, okay? What does this mean for the left hand? So you want to keep the fingers close to the fretboard. When you play, my students sometimes complain they can't see what I'm fingering because I'm so close to the fretboard. Um, I've really trained myself to make the minimal amount of movement because it's better for your timing too. If you move your hands around a lot, then there's a margin of error that you're adding every time because it's gonna take you a second to come down to the fretboard um okay then we have plant fingering to optimize shifts so you always want to think ahead for example if i play a g major scale like this g major right if i play it like this there are a lot of things that i can do to plan my fingering ahead so i don't want to be like you know doing something like that i want to always plan ahead um, you want to feel at home with the most common structures for bass players, also guitar players. Um, triads, for example, is a great thing to have under your belt. And, the, you know, there are certain fingerings that you um, might want to know. So for a major triad, it's great if you start with your second finger. You can also start with your pinky finger, you know. So there, there are all these, like, shapes you want to have under your belt with good fingering. Because if that's out of the way, you see a triad and then boom, the whole hand already knows what to do okay um then don't squeeze the neck now that's a really important one i see this issue a lot with people and i always feel so sorry because it's a it's a bit of a hard habit to get rid of and it's really one that can inhibit the flow of the music so what i mean by that is we oftentimes if you if you finger a note right your fret you have to push down the fret so when you push down the fret your bass or any guitar will go in this direction okay i mean not really but a little bit so we know we have to counteract that movement and we do that typically by squeezing back with the thumb. So we're having this idea of squeezing the wood, right? There's another idea you can just try and if you have your instrument on, make sure you have it strapped. But what, what you can do is use, rather than go this direction and then press back with the thumb, relieve the thumb and allow the instrument to be controlled here with the arm. There's nothing special I need to do with the arm. It's just kind of there. And the weight of the arm provides a counterweight towards this movement, okay? So the best way to feel this is to um, just sort of feel your right arm, your left arm, and the strap, because it's another really important point of connecting to the instrument. Um, and just sort of play with that a little bit and to feel into your hand. And I, I often observe, you know, some people have been playing for a long time. They never maybe even ask themselves, well, what does it feel like and how little force do I really need? And I think that's a really important point. Uh, I just want to check really quick because I think, okay, all good. All right. Um, so 
Do not overwork the thumb. You can sometimes even practice without the thumb, right? I can, I, I can just let go of my thumb and allow my right arm to provide that counterweight. Uh, don't kink any fingers. So you don't want to do this. You know, you just want to keep them nice and round, keep the energy going all the way into the fingertip. Place fingers close to the frets, so that's definitely also good for your tone because if you don't do that, you'll get a buzz. And uh, you want to avoid that. And then I am a big proponent of the one finger per fret position. I have lots of exercises how to get there. If there's time for that, I'll show you a few of them. But it's um, if you have trouble, especially in the lower registers or maybe on a five string to get all the way down there, it's a bit of a stretch, but I have tiny hands and it, it really doesn't matter. It's not the size. Um, so what you do if it's really too hard for you to keep one finger per fret like that, one uh, recommendation that I have is you make tiny shifts, you know? I have a few students who have a really hard time spreading their fingers out like that. So what, what I um, do with them is we just always make tiny little micro movements. And you just get used to that and then over time, slowly the spread gets a little wider. What's happening here is we're using very small muscles and the hand is used to grabbing and carrying heavy stuff. So the big muscles want to help. But by doing that, they oftentimes cramp up the hand. Um, right hand, same thing. We want to, you know, minimize movement. So whenever you pluck, doesn't matter whether it's a pick or plucking motion, you want to do as little movement as possible. So I try to stay as close as possible. None of that, you know, again, makes coordination much harder if you have a lot of movement going on and it will make your timing suffer. Um, keep fingers close to your strings. I always advocate an alternating finger movement. Some people like to do index, middle, ring finger, uh, has a certain sound to it. So if that's what you prefer, go for it, but have a plan. That's um, always my recommendation. If you have a plan, then you don't have to think about which finger am I going to use. It's just there. So I like doing it on autopilot. I train myself with everything I do to do index, middle. When I play, I let go of that. And sometimes I will, you know, do something that's called raking like that. But I can also do it with alternating. So it's a different sound whether you go like this sometimes and whether you go with one finger. So, um, you know, you, you might not always find yourself doing that, but when I practice, I'm very focused on practicing that and that served me very well. Um, what else? Pluck toward the bass for bigger tone. So if you are plucking a, a bass, you want to pluck into the instrument. Oftentimes I see guitar players who switch to bass um, play sort of this arpeggio approach and that will give you a little bit of a wimpy tone if you want to be like in a grooving situation then you might want to um, uh, you know pay attention to that you want to pluck towards the bass body because that gives you a much fatter tone than this okay and it has its uses you know you might do chords or something and then you can do that uh, you want to be able to find the strings without looking you know either doing this or doing that is um, is not going to be helpful for your overall posture. And uh, so I recommend practicing that and then have a plan for the thumb placement. You know, I like to rest on my pickup and then move to the B and the B and the E strings. And that helps me mute and helps me have good control over most of the strings that I need to quiet down when I'm playing. And also on the right hand, don't kink the fingers. You know, if you do something like this, then your finger is kinked and it's better to have them around. So you just want to feel the energy all the way to the tip of the finger. Okay, cool. I want to check in. I see the the chat go crazy here. Okay. The sound quality. All right. So I'm <laughs> playing electric guitar. Cool. Belgium. Right on. Yes, the course is on sale. There's a fantastic back to school sale going on. And if I understand this right, I'm kicking this whole thing off. So this is awesome. Um, yeah, check out super sales going on on uh, membership for the whole year. I think so. It's really cool. Um, Norway. Excellent. Strat King. Very good. This is a uh, shoot. No. Uh, well, I play four, five, or six string bass. This just happens. It's my new bass, so I, I pull it out as much as I can. But I play four, five, and six string at the True Fire course that I did. The um, pentatonic playground is done on four strings. So if you're a four string player, fear not. Um, that is uh, on the four string. And sounding great. Well, thank you. Uh, guitar player from Pennsylvania. Hello. Five string. Yes. Left my Thunderbird upstairs. <laughs> Ready? Go get it, Benjamin. Come on. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I'm getting compliments here. Uh, 
to meetings go what well i can't understand that comment how would you recommend for electric art guitarist to hybrid pick or learn finger picking um so that is really a guitar specific question that i don't think i'm qualified to answer I do a lot of solo bass and um, in those contexts I sometimes will find myself doing picking but I know that for guitar like I'm a huge fan of Muriel Anderson's who I know is also a true fire educator that that figure picking stuff that she is doing is some of the things so there is there are lots of resources for uh, for that question um, the hasteful um to to you know get to the answer of that um i am understanding that's a, a guitar question so please go there preferable for chords yeah so there you know but what what i do on the bass is going to be very very different because the bass when we play chords has very different properties than the guitar obviously because we have to be very careful not to sound muddy so there are lots of different considerations so please ask the guitar players. Now you have, you have a whole schedule of guitar people coming up uh, in the course of this weekend. Um, cool, what's your take on the late Thunderstorms Johnson? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> that is also a true fire question. Hey, from Napa, right on, that's around the corner. Uh, hey, cool, uh, there's a student of my course in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, that's great. Thanks for tuning in. Fantastic. Okay, so it seems like that's the end of the question. So, okay, so that was like my rundown of good bass technique. And, you know, the thing with technique is, again, as I said earlier, I started doing classical and sometimes they didn't even, you know, if you didn't have the fingers right, you weren't allowed to play any music. That's overdoing it. But to have a technique practice in place um, every time you pick up your instrument I think is a very smart thing to do it can help you push up the speed for example if you want you pick any kind of exercise or something I'll be giving you later today here and you just set the metronome and you keep a little notebook and then every day you try to you know get just a little bit faster or be a little bit more relaxed or keep your thumb a little bit more relaxed so there are lots of um, well, lots of different ways how you can um, challenge yourself and it's really fun to do like half a part of your tech your practice session dedicated to technique okay um what's my style of bass i play golly i play in uh jazz situations i've just recently uh played a lot in a fusion band I uh, do pop, rock, um, I have done, I've played with Celtic rock band Tempest, I've played with uh, the, 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 the kindy rock band, the Sippy Cups, uh, it's um, kind of punk rock for kids, if you will. I also do a lot of really eclectic stuff on the bass, so I play six string and I tap, and I have a duo with bassoon player Paul Hansen, where, you know, I'll, I'll be laying down a lot of chords. And uh, yeah, I love all styles. There's there's never enough time to learn, and um, it's it's always you know there's always play, places to grow. And I feel I you know the electric bass is such a new instrument, it's such a young instrument still. There's so much room to explore things, and I'm a big fan of Michael Manrings and uh, people like Xander Zahn, uh, you know, who Cody Wright, who do a lot of solo bass, Steve Lawson too. So. You know, just the sound of bass, I think, is, 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 is a wide open field to explore. But I'll, you know, I'll do any kind of band situations. I play in a um, um, top 40 wedding band. So, you know, I love to groove just as much as I love to figure out complex chords or tapping or stuff like that. Um, cool. What, you, what would your practice routine look like? Joe from the Netherlands. Hey, cool. Um, so a practice routine for me always starts with technique. And actually, that gives me a great segue to start talking a little bit about a uh, exercise regimen that I recommend. Guitar just works just the same. Um, and that's called the permutation exercises. I'll show you how that works. And I do about five to ten minutes of that. And then I might pivot to something else, you know, repertoire, I'm pretty organized. I have a little notebook and, you know, I'll, I'll work on technique. That's how I always start. Then um, I'll, I'll work on repertoire, depending on what's going on with the band schedule. If I have to learn some songs for a gig, 
Um, but then I will work on fretboard harmony. I'll work on whatever theory concept I'm working on at the moment. I love giving myself little exercises. So I come up with little, you know, challenges. How can I incorporate a certain scale and, um, and, um, how can I, you know, uh, challenge myself to play faster on a certain lick or something like that. So I, I'm fairly organized. I'll always write it down and try to pick up where I left off the day before. And I think that makes a big difference. And I found you don't need to practice hours and hours a day if you are very focused and if you have a progression going, you know. So I try to uh, hit my band material. There's, there's that. But aside from that, I always try to get a little bit of practice in for myself. And technique is always part of that. So let me show you a way how you can share your technique. So I hope you all have your access, access. Excuse my accent. I'm from Austria. So uh, your axis, axis out. And uh, I want to show you something. You have four fingers that will be picking, uh, that will be fretting with your left hand. So one, two, three, four. Those four numbers, you can scramble up for 24 ways. Okay. So you can go one, two, three, four. You can go one, two, four, three. You can go one, three, two, four. One, four, two, three. Right. So that's the starting point. Then. Uh, you can um, take any of those four numbers, and that's why you don't want to keep a notebook because there's no way to remember what numbers you did on Monday. You know, you want might want to keep the hard ones, do, do them a couple a couple of days. So let's say we'll do one, two, four, three. Okay, so you go one, two, four, three, and now you can either go this way or you can go that way. One, two, four, three, and now I'm gonna go down this way. And as I'm doing that, you know, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, that is so boring. There's nothing going on. I could do that really fast, you know. But don't waste the opportunity because this is the place where you can teach yourself a really solid, what I call default tone, where it sounds smooth, your notes sound connected, you think about your thumb, you think about your right arm providing the counterweight, uh, you think about you know, even sound in the right hand so that not one finger sounds much louder than the other. It's a really great opportunity to zoom in on those um, details. And you know, if you think about your favorite player, they probably, they play two or three notes and you immediately know it's them. And it's not because of what they play necessarily, but it's because of how they sound with the strings, you know, how they connect with the instrument, the, the phrasing, the tone, the everything. And that is really very closely connected to their technique. So it's, that's your opportunity to develop that for yourself and to see, well, where am I holding tension, you know? So one my one, two, four, three, and then I go down. I want to set a metronome. I want to try to push the um, to push the tempo up as hard as you can, you know, challenge yourself, that sort of thing. And then you can, you know, you can go down and then you screw it up and then you do that. If you want to challenge yourself even more, you can try saying the new names while you do that. That's a great exercise. C, D flat, E flat, D, F, F sharp, G flat, uh, G sharp, G. You know, so you can pick, I'm going to say all flats, I'm going to say all sharps, whatever, what have you. This will never get boring. It's also stuff that you can even do when you're sitting in traffic. You know, just imagine you're playing that and you're saying the note names. Tough, tough, deceivingly looks simple but it can be really tough so you can go this way and then switch up and do go all the way up or you can just do it on one string these are called permutation exercises by the way i have written a book and they are described in it let's show you music theory for the bass player so that's all in there that has a big chapter on technique the whole chapter 12 is all technique um you know and then and then you go back i can talk and play um but then you can come up with the wackiest um combinations of this and this you know for example you can do going up one fret and one string at the same time See? so now i'm going up a fret and a string so i'm weaving this like it's like a zigzag 
Um, so that's a variation. Um, you can go down one way and go down the mirror image. So if I go up one, two, four, three, if that's how I'm going up, I can go all the way up and then turn around. So one, two, four, three, if you read that backwards, that's three, four, one, two, right? Is that even right? One, two, four, three, three, four, two, one. Yeah, I felt so. Um, three, four, two, one, three, four, two, one, three, four, two, one, three, four, two, one, right? So you're having one way you're going up and one way you're going down, and especially if you're a bass player who's trying to learn alternating, which I so recommend. It's an interesting exercise because as you go on up, you'll have like let's say I'm starting with the index, so index, middle, index, middle, index, middle, index, middle, all the way up. I will always have my index finger here when I have my index finger here, right? So as I'm going up like that, okay, nice and well. But if I now go back in the mirror image, that's gonna get scrambled because I'm having to still alternate. So now three, four, two, one feels so differently in my hand. Okay, so it's wicked how different that feels because now I'm, you know, having these two fingers, this is going down at the same time. So with these permutation exercises, you never run out of combinations that are great. And don't feel like you want to be super great at one, two, four, three. You know, as soon as you begin to feel one, two, four, three, I'm, get, I'm really getting that under my belt. Switch something. Change the direction, change the numbers, change the, you know, starting finger. Um, start on top, go down, and then go back up. Okay, so it's really all about just keeping moving with the different fingers. So you always want to switch it up. All right, let me see. What's tap bass? What would you practice with? So I hope this, this answers your question, um, Joe. Was tap bass hard for you to learn? You know, I my background is in piano, and when I started playing uh, tapping, it felt like I had a lot of that being at the same time, you know, this thing, where you were like doing one, with the, 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 the coordination between the hands. Um, that was something that was not too hard for me. Um, I'll play you a song in a minute that has some tapping in it, um, but the, the sort of the mechanics of the, of the tapping, you know? You are and if I mean there's a lot of exercises I could give you or tell you about when when we're talking about tapping I want to sort of keep it close to technique but um, a, a couple of tips I can give you for tapping is um, the setup of the bass is important by the way this is not my per se tapping bass but if I have my six string is set up mostly for tapping and it has very thin strings and um, or very thin thinner I usually play with thicker strings but um, it's still comparatively on the thinner side and uh, the the action is a little bit on the lower side so those things help and then you want to you know set the the amp accordingly it's a different setup than what you have for grooving and then sort of to just create the tone is you can and let's say we're practicing a scale okay so you can just start with one hand and then practice that okay like that and by the way i use this little gadget a lot when i tap can't use it when you use the open strings because they <laughs> they get muted. What it is, it's a fret rep by Groove Gear, and it's um it's a little twisty tie, if you will, like what you do for hair, but it's a little more sophisticated and really nice to um, get on and off the bass easily, and doesn't scratch the the, the instrument like some hair ties do. So I really I really like um, using it, and you can just pull it on and off. I usually keep it up there, just in case I want to do some tapping, and it helps to keep the. You know, to keep it all. See, you have a little bit of a ring. So, if you if you have it on, then then you you get dead quiet, and that's really nice. So yeah, you start with one hand, and you know, but then you bring in the left, and that's the two-handed tapping thing. But it's really fun because you can let's say I'm going on the D. D is the uh, five of the G chord, so. Against the 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 D instead of the open G, right? And then 
I can do things with both hands. So, for example, I do two on the left. You know, um, things like that. And then you, you, you know, you train yourself to do that. Um, then you can also pull off into, let's say, prescription of teaching yourself tapping is keep one hand consistent so right now when I did that I kept my right hand on the G right now I can do the same idea keeping my left hand doing the same thing but my right hand is now moving So you keep one of the hands stationary. First of all, it sounds good, and you can do a lot of can get a lot of ideas for you know these sort of patterns. But it it's also uh, so it's a great starting board for ideas. But it also makes makes it a little more manageable because you know with with tapping there's a lot of pretty complex stuff you can get into, and and this breaks it down. Um, archives yes and Jeff hooked you up with that info cool do you have any methods or techniques to learning new songs in general and ones that may require a certain skill so when I learn songs I try to be um, as organized about it as I possibly can so what I mean by that is um, it, you know it depends a little bit what it is if it is a like a cover band gig um, and I need to learn a lot of songs in a very short time. I will approach that in a different way than when I, for example, practice a transcription or practice one of my own songs. So it's a little bit of a longer answer. But um, the methods I use is I want to chart something out and um, have some, some sort of, in, with my own tunes, I oftentimes record it. Um, and videotape it too because with that tapping stuff you sometimes don't remember how did I do that which finger and you know uh, so it's it's nice to videotape it but when I work up a, a, a let's say a cover song I will chart out a chart that it'll include the name of the song it'll include the author or the band or whoever wrote it uh, made it famous whoever the bass player is if, if it's um, somebody I'm interested in and then the style um, because, you know, in a pinch when you have like hundreds of these sheets in front of you and you'll just need to spur your memory, what was that? And then it says bossa or rock or funk or something. That's really helpful. Uh, then I'll set the tempo, you know, just about, you know, metronome setting or um, fast or medium or something like that. And then I'll write down um, the, the form, like intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, you know, kind of like the high level overview. And then I will, you know, figure out the chords and then I will figure out um, maybe fills or licks or unison lines or certain stops that are important uh, from for the bass uh, to execute. I might not transcribe the groove verbatim, but I might write the first couple of bars and then say simile like that, you know, keep going in that vein. Um, and, um, and that will sort of then provide a structure. And the nice thing about that is I just archive that and I'll have it for the future. And, you know, many gigs you come back to and it's like, oh, that song, didn't I play that back then? You know, and then of course it's a different key and you have to figure that out. But, uh, you already cut down a lot of the work, um, by having done that, uh, sort of chart, you know, and I think the most important things that it should contain is what's the rhythmic responsibility. Uh, what's, what's the rhythms about um, chord changes and the form it's, it's really important uh, especially if it's like a jam kind of a thing where people might open up parts and it's like go to the bridge you know so you know where to jump in your chart um, so I hope that answers your question uh, okay watching this while on BART that's funny um, okay cool uh, see a piano do you use the piano to learn tunes hmm, not really I you know, being a bass player, I am sometimes guilty of focusing too much on the bass, actually. And I've learned that it 
serves you very well if you're also aware of what's the whole chord not just the root yeah i'm playing c for eight bars but is it c minor is it c major seven what is it and uh so i can usually figure that out using the bass you know if i need any kind of feedback if i don't hear it right away um but you can uh, I, I use the piano all the time for all sorts of, you know, composing and, and practicing and teaching and, you know, um, figuring out songs sometimes, sure. But if I have the bass, it doesn't really matter which, which tool I have in my hand. Um, the piano. I like doing them on one string because you can practice shifting as well. I would assume that that was in response to me playing scales pick and stone i don't know what that comment referred to so help me out uh do you play right hand with your thumb only any advice right hand with my thumb only you mean like this sort of thing um so as with all technique that i talk about <laughs> i am very um interested in being as loose and as relaxed as possible and a lot of people slap um, kind of like this coming from the top down or even using a lot of your arm. I know Flea does that because he has his bass by his knees. I'm a huge Flea fan, so he's awesome. But I couldn't do that. And it doesn't work for me very well. Just the way my body is built and where I like to hold my bass and all that. So my, my idea is I keep my thumb as loose as possible. And I will just it will just float out by the sheer... Uh, way of me tilting my wrist right or turning my wrist I should say so my thumb kind of flies out because of the uh, centrifugal power is that how you call it um <laughs> but what I mean by that is it's it's really not very tense and a lot of people when they slam slap like this thumb like that or uh you know sometimes you see people talk about their thumb like needs to be really stuck out and like uh hard in in like working hard um i don't do that i keep it as loose as possible and and i come a little bit from underneath so i want to be parallel with my thumb as opposed to this way or even you know if anything i want to come from below um so I, my advice would be to look to be as relaxed and loose as possible. Now, I've, I've, oftentimes when you then do the Victor Wooten double thumbing, then you have to um, get under the string and then you have to kind of keep your, your thumb locked. You can't just keep it nice and loose, but you have to keep it locked. So that's a different uh, idea and approach but just for the regular thumbing uh, I think that's a good place to start and another good thing to practice is because what's a little bit hard with slapping is that you find where the strings are so I do a lot of um, you know don't look at your right hand but just find where the strings are these kind of exercises Oh, good to know. Oh, I play right on it. Okay, like your enthusiasm. Thank you. No questions. Thanks for doing this. Cool, right on. Muted version of thumb. Muted version of thumb. Uh, say more, Benjamin. Uh, please say, give me context because I talk about other things and then I don't know what your questions <laughs> refer to. <laughs> so you mean this? Like kind of reggae style? Maybe you're talking about thumb muting. That's something we do a lot in reggae. You know, to get this this really kind of dead sound and then of course I would have a huge big ampeg behind me and crank the low end and get rid of the mids um, and um, you know that's all part of the sound so that's thumb muting and with thumb mute it's actually it's a total misnomer isn't it because you're really muting with the palm of your hand palm muting it's called palm muting duh hello um, so palm muting um, so I, and I'm playing with the thumb I sometimes actually also play with the fingers it depends on what it is I'm just a little faster with my fingers sometime hey from Brazil right on I love Brazil um, wonderful um, okay um, let's see I had so much prepared I want to think about what we talk about so I talked about the permutation exercises right if you do nothing else just before even when everybody's sound checking or whatever just run four numbers 
hey, tell me a number, tell me another number, one number between two and one and four, you know, and then you get your four numbers, totally random, and you just run through that, and it gives you an opportunity to really zoom in into your right hand, don't make too much movement, you know, keep my thumb loose, there are all these things you can think about, don't just go through the motions. There is a technique that I teach that is called the Pora technique, and there's another uh, guide, it's a four-step process, and there's another guide on my website um, that I encourage you to download. It's a process that walks you through practicing using the principles of rotating attention. That's what Pora stands for, so principles of rotating attention. And what it does is when you you practice something let's say uh you know a permutation figure it shouldn't be too long so it wouldn't be like all the way up all the way down just a couple of rounds you know and you know you have your favorite things that you like to do wrong like you know shoulders up by the ears or you know starting to tense up or you know being uh, making a lot of movement with your right or having your fingers stick out right these favorite things that you know you do and don't want to do, and it's so hard to get rid of them. But Pora really enables you to do so. And the way you do it is you determine what it is. Okay, I want to keep my fingers closer, right? And then you do a round of this exercise and focus in on keep your fingers close, keep your fingers close. I don't care if you're not alternating. I don't care if the timing is bad. Nothing else matters. The only thing that matters is that you keep your fingers close. Then you do a second round with your second pet peeve. Let's say your, your shoulders are up by your ear. Okay, now I don't care if your fingers are sticking out, but your shoulder has to be down. Okay, you get the idea? So, um, and then you, you follow this four-step process. Seems fairly simple, but if you do it right, it's actually a very exhausting process because we are, all of a sudden, our mind is focused in on something. We're not just going through the motions. We're focused in and... Um, I think it makes a huge difference. If you practice just five minutes like that, you have you give yourself a huge payoff. Um, so that's the Pora method. I wanted to make sure to mention that because it's very, very powerful. And um, then I wanted to, let's see, how about I play you guys a tune? Um, oh, wait a minute, let me see what others are saying. Do you have exercises for keeping frantic fingers close to the neck? So I would say the Pora thing is probably the best thing you can do. And I'll play you a tune in a second. Um, but yeah, I think you the Pora thing is is really gold for that sort of thing. Or you can also, if you don't want to do a permutation, if you let's say you're playing a tune, and in the tune you all of a sudden see, oh gosh, I'm sticking out my fingers again, then play that tune. Play it through one time where it's okay to have not good timing. It's okay to, uh, you know, do all sorts of other things. But the one thing you're gonna do throughout the whole tune is focus in on keeping your fretting fingers close, and then you let it go. Then you go practice, you play your gig, you have fun, right? And then this is what happens typically. Somebody takes a photo of you and you see yourself and he's like, oh my God, the finger's just sticking out again, right? That's okay. That's part of the process. So don't worry about this. As long as you have some sort of regular pour up practice where you are really honed in and focused in on these minimal movements with your left hand, it will start to creep into your consciousness because then what starts happening is you're going to be playing and you look down and here there are the fingers and you go, gosh, but that's a good moment because it means you're starting to notice, okay? It's kind of not a pleasant moment because we want it to be gone. We want the fingers to stop doing this. But no, you just realize, oh my gosh, I'm doing it, but now I'm becoming aware. So you actually high five yourself. You say, oh, cool. I'm entering the next stage of learning, which is that the unconscious mistakes are becoming conscious. So now, you know, what do you do in the moment? You fix it and you go on your merry way. And the next day you do your pora again, just a minute or two, just focusing on the left hand. And again, you let it go. And before you know it, it will start um, becoming the default feeling because you give so much attention to it while you practice it. I hope this makes sense. I think it's a great question and uh, it's very much worthwhile going through it. I have a real problem with my pinky flying. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing with the pinky flying is oftentimes left hand issues really go back to overgripping the thumb. That's what I um, mentioned earlier. When, you know, we overgrip, we squeeze, we use way more power than we need to, and a whole hand is like overworking. Uh, you want to teach yourself to be as loose as possible in the left hand and to just sort of feel your instrument, maybe even while you're watching TV or doing something that doesn't really require your full attention um, 
then you can you can just have your bass in the hand and just feel what it feels like if you you know squeeze the neck or can you just let go of the thumb and then what happens i'm not advocating playing without the thumb there's no reason to do that but it should just be there for guidance you know and also make sure that it doesn't stick out uh, i mean sometimes we might go into that for a brief moment just to relieve our hand but the default position should be for this thumb to sort of be back there because it gives you much more room to reach the notes and um you know all these movements just take a minute every time you pick up your instrument and just sort of feel into it i mean we often don't even take the time because we're so worried about the right notes and the right chords and getting it all uh you know grooving and all that which is all important stuff of course but it it pays off to sort of just feel what does this instrument feel against my body and you know the strap the fingers here and this you know i i just feel this control with the instrument right there and i think um it's worth worth doing and i see a lot of changes in my students if that's all they do you know just put a little consciousness in there how much force do i really need and um you might feel you might find yourself just having um your your fingers being less of a you know flying situation here if if your thumb is loose because it just relieves your whole hand um I'd rather go to bed. Good night, Benjamin. Sleep well. Good night to France. Um, my gosh, it's 3 a.m. over there, isn't it? Um, do I play upright? Wait, there was a flying pinky. Okay. Um, I didn't do any research. Just asking, do you play just electric or upright too? I do play both. Um, electric is definitely my main instrument, but I, I do gig on it sometimes, and I do play upright as well. Um, is, um, thank you for your answers. Yeah, okay. Do you practice in front of a mirror? Yeah, actually, sometimes I do, uh, especially upright. Uh, I always have a mirror on a music stand, um, on a bass stand, actually, uh, like full full body mirror. And because I want to see my posture uh, as I'm standing with the instrument. So I think that's a good idea. And uh, the mirror definitely helps because you also want to get away from this habit of always looking down, you know. So sometimes looking at yourself in the mirror can help bridge that gap. Then obviously you don't want to use the mirror to find your frets, but since it's turned around, that's not very likely to happen anyway. Um, do you play bass in classical sitting position? Um, you know, I play. I love playing Bach. It's one of my favorite baseline creators <laughs> is is Bach and I um I play a lot of that stuff sitting for sure I also play a lot sitting when I play with my six string but uh to answer your question I never use the the classical situation where you have your instrument between your legs and then maybe use a stool I don't like that that feels very different for me and also the way basses are built um it, it it almost feels like it's sagging a little bit for for guitars obviously in the right situations that's what you want to do um but for bass i'm i'm always liking to have a position that as close to sitting as it is to standing so i want my fret length to be so that when i stand up it doesn't really do a lot of moving around and that there's not a lot of changes for it um and you're requesting to play a tune i'd be happy to do that um oh good thank you um miles uh. All right, let's see. I'll play. How about some Stevie Wonder for you? Um, actually, before I do that, I want to put your attention to something because I'm going to be using some. We're talking about technique here, right? So I want to put your attention to something that I'm using here in this tune. Uh, when I go into my solo, I'll be using tapping, all, all sorts of stuff. But when I go into my solo, I'll be using a technique that's called pedaling. That's a killer exercise for technique. So... Maybe if I can talk and play at the same time, I'll point it out. But uh, it's called pedaling. And it, um, it, that's basically pedaling. So whenever you play something and then play the root in between. But I'll play you the tune. And um, okay, see how it goes.
sunshine of your love yes oh nice thank you um yeah some position i i copy that from steve bailey and he has it from the upright so sometimes when i can't reach something i i go to um i go to use the thumb um and you know i want to point out this technique because this is such a great uh technique exercise pedaling whenever you practice scales you're all are practicing scales right scales super helpful when you practice your next scale try this Play the root in between each and every note, like this. Instead of playing G major, play the root in between. First of all, it's technically challenging. Second of all, you can go to sort of um, making a theory exercise out of it by going major second, major third, fourth, fifth, major six, major seven, octave, right? And you can do it from the top down, which is minor second, minor third, fourth, fifth, minor six, minor seventh, an octave, okay? It's a great coordination exercise because you have to jump strings like crazy on your right hand and also, you know, keep it consistent on your left. And it's something that you can use in a musical context. I'm gonna show you something else. You can do the same idea up and down a string. So let's say I'm doing it on the G string, right? Actually, y'all know this tune? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that's uh, that's an example of pedaling. If y'all know this tone, yes, Ficken Stahl's got it. Thunderstruck, um, ACDC. But um, it's in different key. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a B string here. I have a B string, but that's not very good. So, um, but that's pedaling, okay? And pedaling is a is a very effective and kind of virtuoso sounding technique. It's not that difficult to do. It teaches you coordination because your right hand and your left hand really have to be in sync when you do that. Um, but I encourage you to practice your scales using pedaling. And here's a very cool way to use the, the pedals. Um, you have, uh, you know, you can do one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two grouping. So do one. Your, your pedal note in between and then the other note. But you can also do other things like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Right? Um, you can also do um, things like three plus three plus two is eight. Sounds cool. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Right? So three plus three plus two groupings sound really cool. And when we're talking about practicing scales, um, you can do a whole scale regimen using pedaling. This is something I like to do. Modes, right? You're all practicing your modes. Um, so what I like to do with modes, I always start them out on the same route. And then let's say I'm, I keep doing them in G and I'm gonna be using pedaling, okay? And I like to do the modes not from like Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, how they are typically like done in order, but I like to do them from the brightest sound to the darkest sound. The brightest mode is Lydian, and it's a major scale with a sharp 11 or sharp 4, okay? Um, and um, then I go down the list to the darkest mode, which is Locrian, which sounds, you know, very, it's a minor scale with a flat 2 and a flat 5. So. It sounds very dissonant and compressed. So why don't I show you that? And I'll try to, um, I'll try to, to, to tell you the scale I'm on. Let's see how I do. So um, let me just get like uh, some sort of a tempo going here. But uh, it's nice to hear, first of all, it's nice to hear the three plus three plus two groupings. So that's one thing I want you to put your ear on, um, for your ear out for. So the three plus three plus two groupings, the pedaling that I'm using, uh, and the motes. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to, to, to say, say them as I go through them. Okay, that's good. So we'll start out with Lydian. That's a great practice because you're shedding your technique, you're thinking about your um, modes, you're thinking about coordination, um, and you are doing the three plus three plus two grouping. So there's a lot to keep in mind. And I love exercises like that because they're super multitasking, you know, so I feel like I've just shed my technique, my, my theory, my scales, you know, so it um, gives you some sort of a double whammy. So I highly recommend you try this. And, you know, don't go crazy on the tempo in the beginning. It's, um, it's something you want to get used to. And you can do this, you know, with the open string, how I just did it. But you can also do it, you know, with the, um, with the not open string. So. You know, things like that. Okay, let me look at the. Uh, you've been there some some things written that are not finished i'm not sure wonderful version thank you wonderful um okay i love that song gives me something to aim at oh, i'll get to go practice on bass nice <laughs> okay cool i think we're about at time anyways so uh doing more live streams i'd love to great exercises and your enthusiasm out of it to play oh that's very nice to hear thank you um yeah i'd love to i'm i love true fire i love being part of the family so 
um, yeah, um, anytime I'm, I'm here. If you have any questions, uh, my, uh, my website is arianacap.com. I also have a blog out where I post new blog base related material once a week. So uh, please check it out. You can subscribe there for free and there's lots and lots of educational resources. So lots of stuff on technique. And uh, my book, again, is Music Theory for the Bass Player. If you want to check it out, it's up on Amazon. And it comes with 89 videos. And then I also have a course out that works you through the book with tons of technique exercises um, on top of just the theory and groove creation and fretboard harmony and just lots of different stuff. So, um, yeah, it's been awesome to hanging out with you guys online, live, all over the world. I love it um great well thank you thank you very much all these nice comments uh, it's really great to hear thanks so much true fire jeff for having me and helping me with the setup and making it all really really easy to do so uh that's just super cool all right everybody have a good day night morning whatever it is over where you are and uh thanks so much for tuning in it's been really really fun thank you <laughs> cheers